Welcome to this sailing theory tutorial. My name is Julian. The topic of this video is sail construction and sail care. In this video, we're going to talk about how a sail maker builds shape into a sail. We're also going to talk about sail materials and sail care. In a future video, we'll talk about how sailors could control their sail shape and why they might want to do that. Then we'll talk about the effects of various sail controls. So to start us off, I'd like to review what I mean by shape. So from my previous video, when I'm talking about shape, I'm talking about the sectional shape of the sail. If you're not sure what I mean, go back and watch the last video that I uploaded called Introduction to Sail Shape. The general shape of a sail is something like this. There's curvature near the front of the sail. There's a straight section near the back of the sail. And you want to have some depth in your sail. How much, we'll talk about later. I want to introduce you to the idea of controlling the shape. And what I want you to know is that if you're controlling the shape of the sail, what you're really doing is controlling the depth of the sail all the way along the sail from the front to the back. Let me illustrate that for you. So if I had a bunch of distances here that I would measure from the cord line of the sail, that would be my depth at different stations along the sail. And then if I drew my sail material in white across all of those depths, what I would have is a controlled shape of my sail. Of course, we don't have a way of setting the depth all the way along the sail, but we do have certain ways of trying to put depth into the sail, and I'm going to talk about those in this video. So our objective is to control the depth of the sail. How do we do that? Well, Instead of just telling you right off the bat, I want you to think about the game Parachute that you might have played in preschool. I'll remind you of the basic premise of this game. You get a bunch of people together and they all hold corners of the parachute. If the people back away from each other, they can pull the parachute tight. And what that looks like from the side is a straight, flat parachute. On the other hand, if they run together, then the parachute's going to sag in the middle. But the players can actually flip the parachute up in the air. And if they do that, then whatever amount of sagging the parachute would have done towards the ground actually happens up into the air. And you can get some pretty spectacular domes over your head when you're playing this game with kids. So now let's take that same idea, but we'll apply it to a piece of material that has straight edges instead of being a round circle like the parachute. If we pull that shape tight and then we draw a section view through it, we would expect the same thing. We'll see it straight and flat. But if we make a copy of that piece of material, and we make one of the sides round instead of straight, and then we give it back to those same people who are going to hold it tight, we're going to see something interesting happen. So the holder in the middle here wants to move out so that they can hold the edge of the material. But what if that holder's feet were glued in place? So that person couldn't move. But you told them that they still had to hold onto the material in front of them, the same way that they held the green one. Well, what that's going to do is force the curved material to take a straight line between those three people holding it. And if we drew a section through that, we would see again that we end up with some sag in the material. So it's the same concept as before, and it lets us give a 2D piece of material some three-dimensional shape. One of the ways that a sailmaker adds shape to a sail is to add curvature to the edges of the sail. So take, for instance, a straight mast and a straight boom. We have a triangular sail here, and let's say that we're going to add some curvature to the luff of the sail. When we take that sail and we run it up the mast, all of that curvature is extra material that's in the sail because the mast is straight in this case. And so what we would see happen is that the mast would push that material back into the sail until that curved edge becomes straight along the mast. And if we were to draw a section view in the sail where that curvature was pushed in, what we would expect to see is that we get some depth from the edge curve. 
So it's been pushed in and it causes some depth. And so we can put curvature on all three sides of our sail. If it's at the left, we would call it left curve. If it's on the foot, we would call it foot curve. The leech has some curvature too, but it's a little bit more complicated and we're not really going to get into it. But remember that we want to keep a relatively straight profile near the edge of the leech. So if we want to keep a straight profile, we've got to do some funky things with the curvature there to try to pull that material straight. That's not the only way that a sailmaker can put shape into a sail. But before we move on, I want to tell you an advantage of shape added through the edge curvature. So an advantage to adding shape this way is that sailors can actually change the amount of depth added by changing the shape that they force the edge to take. So one example of this would be mast bend. If we have left curve, we can affect what shape we force that left to take by changing the bend of the mast. We'll talk about that in another video. I should say as well though that there is some trouble with shape added through edge curvature. And that trouble is that it can be unstable. So if we take some left curve and we push shape into the sail at the left, what would happen if we took that sail out in the wind? Well, as the wind blows on the sail, it's going to be pushing on the material. And it's actually going to push the material backwards. So all that shape that we added near the front of the sail is going to bubble backwards and we'll end up with our draft moving backwards and moving around in the wind. So that instability can actually be a problem for us if we put too much shape in by edge curve alone. Which brings us to a second way that a sailmaker puts shape into a sail. And that's by adding curvature to the seams. So if you look at a sail, it's usually pretty clear that they're not made in one single piece of material. If you look closely, you can see stitching. And the sail is made of a number of what are called panels, which are individual pieces of material that are seamed together. If we were to pick the sail apart at the seams, and we took a look at the panels, we would notice that the edges of each panel have their own curvature. When a sailmaker puts the panels together, they force that curvature together along a straight line. If we take a closer look at that, we can see how at every seam, we're going to end up with material being pushed in on a straight line, adding depth in the sail. So we should be able to draw some sort of a parallel between what we saw before with the edge curvature and now what we're seeing with the seam curvature. The last thing I wanna do is show you again that if we took a section view through the sail, we would see that all the way along the sail, we're able to push a certain amount of extra material in at the seams, and that's gonna give us some depth. The sailmaker can control how much depth actually goes in. So now I'll tell you that a major advantage of shape that's added through seam curve is that it's much more stable. So because the seams run all the way through the sail, depth can be added exactly where it's needed to give the sail the desired shape. And if we take this illustration, for instance, we're just going to see that all the way through the sail, on different points on the seam, we're getting different amounts of curvature that's added to the sail. Of course, it wouldn't be a balanced presentation if I didn't tell you a disadvantage as well. And so a disadvantage, if you want to look at it this way, is that seam curvature is essentially a permanent part of the sail. You can't change it very easily. So once the sail's built, it's built with a certain shape intended, and then throughout the life of the sail, you don't have any chance to go back in there and make any tweaks. So what do we want when we're ordering a sail? Let's say I want to buy a sail for my boat. Well, you want some combination of edge and seam shape. You can trust your sailmaker to make a decision about how much of each is appropriate. But understanding how the shape gets put into your sail is going to help us understand a little bit later how we can tweak the shape of our sail by using our sail controls. Now we can move on to taking a look at sail materials, or what's often called sail cloth. So I've brought a couple of pictures up of J24s here, and these are sailboats that use a couple of different sail materials for the different sails on the boat. If we take a look here, we can see that the main sail on this boat, which I'm going to highlight in orange, is made of a material called Dacron, and that's a white sail cloth, usually anyways. Sometimes it comes in colors. 
We can take a look at the Spinnaker on the right, which is made up of blue and magenta nylon. That's another type of sailcloth that we're going to talk about. A third sail material that I'd like to talk about is what the Genoa that I'm highlighting in yellow is made of. We're going to call this a laminate sail material, and we'll talk about it later. So we'll start with Dacron. What is Dacron? Well, Dacron is a woven cloth that's made of polyester. It's a common material. But if you think about what that means, we have a cloth that's made up of yarns that are woven together. And we have to treat that cloth with something so that we can hold those yarns in place and make them rigid enough to build a sail out of. Another reason why we treat them with resin is to make them impermeable, basically to make them airtight. Otherwise, wind would be able to blow between the weave of the cloth. A couple advantages of Dacron when you use it in sails is that it's relatively cheap compared to a laminate sail, and it's relatively stiff compared to nylon. And when I say stiff, I mean that it's not very stretchy. The disadvantages of Dacron is that because it's a weave, it's stronger in one direction than another, and the direction of its strength has a lot to do with how it comes off the roll. So depending on the shape and size of the sail you're making, it might not be convenient to make it out of Dacron. Another disadvantage is that to get more strength out of Dacron, you make it thicker. And this is true of most materials, but let's just say that Dacron gets pretty heavy when you're trying to make a big sail out of it. Now, if we want to talk about spinnaker material, that's usually nylon. So nylon's another kind of woven cloth and it's made of nylon yarns. Nylon is actually the kind of material. So it's commonly used in spinnakers, and it's not often used for mainsails or headsails. And there's a good reason for that, which we'll talk about in the disadvantage. So the advantage, though, of nylon is that it's very lightweight, and it can be very strong. When I say strong, what I mean is that if you take the material and you start pulling it, it's not going to pull apart. It can take a beating. It's pretty tough for its weight. But the major disadvantage about nylon, if you're using it in sail material, is that it's very stretchy. If you tried to use nylon to make a mainsail or a jib, what you would find is that all of the shape that you try to put into that sail is going to blow around to different places in the sail. And the last kind of sail material that I said we were going to talk about is a laminate. And this is actually just a whole group of sail materials that we're lumping together into one right now. So a laminate is a fusion of polyethylene, which is mylar, that are in films. And you have some load-bearing fibers that you're going to place between the films. Some examples of fibers that are commonly used are Kevlar, Technora, Carbon, Vectran, and the list goes on. So in the diagram, I'm drawing my films, and we're going to put the fibers in between the films. And then the thing that I'm not drawing that you'd have to imagine is there is some sort of a glue that holds the laminates together. They don't just stick together on their own. What are the major advantages of using a laminate sail? Well, you can use very strong fibers when needed, and that's going to make the sail both strong in terms of toughness and also not stretchy. But you can also make it light in areas that don't require high strength. Another advantage that comes with using laminates is that they can be molded. And we see this with Norsail's 3DL, 3DI technology, for instance. Now, what's our major disadvantage with using a laminate sail? For one, it's the cost. The material cost for a laminate sail is going to be higher than for Dacron, probably. Another thing is that sometimes they can lack a certain durability, but this is going to depend on the laminate. And in modern sails, it's really not a concern. Your sailmaker can find a laminate that's appropriate for your sail, if they think that that's the right thing to do. With an idea of what our sails are made of, let's move on to sail care and talk about some things that cause our sails to break down. And we can start things off by talking about cuts and scrapes. So let's think about, about a couple scenarios that might result in cuts to our sails. So maybe our sails are damaged due to a collision. This could happen on the water or on land if we have a rigged boat and we're moving it around in the boat park. Maybe we're being careless and we drag our sails on the ground. Or we leave our boat rigged and the sail blows around and hits something sharp. So 
If any of those things happen and we end up with small cuts in our sales, minor damage can be easily repaired by a sale maker. And I'm going to recommend that if you have minor cuts and scrapes in your sales, that you get them taken care of as soon as possible. Because what can happen is if you have a rip in your sale and you take it out on a windy day, that rip can open up bigger and bigger. And um, even though you can sew large rips shut, the bigger they are, and especially if they cross multiple seams or you know in, into different panels, they're going to be difficult to repair and the sale is never going to be the same. And what I mean by that is that the shape of the sale is actually going to be permanently different if the rip goes through different panels. And that has to do with the way that the sale is put together with shape in the seams. Okay, so another thing that we might want to consider is stretching and shrinking of sales. So over time and with heating cycles, both cloth and laminate sales can shrink, although laminate sales tend to shrink more than cloth sales. Just like your t-shirt, if your sale shrinks, it's not going to have the same shape afterwards. So it might shrink more in one direction than another, and you can only imagine what that would do to the shape of an airfoil if it got fatter and shorter or longer and thinner. It would have a different shape than the sailmaker designed it with, and it won't perform the same way. And on the flip side of that, if a sail is over trimmed or if it's used under high loads, it can actually stretch. An example I'll provide for that is an over trimmed jib. And so typically if we have a jib, it's going to be built with some shape and we might be able to tell that it's over trimmed if we pull all that shape out of the foot and make it board board flat. So imagine that you've pulled your jib so board flat and you're pulling so hard that the foot and the leech are actually stretched. So if you stretch your sail or if your sail shrinks, that damage can't really be repaired. It's just going to be a permanent part of your sail from now on. And so you're changing the shape of your sail and you're going to make it work not as well and it's going to last that way forever. And finally, something that I want to consider is why sail material gets soft over time. And if you don't know that to be true, take it from me. It's true. It happens. And what I mean by soft is it sort of loses its crinkle. So let's say you take a, a fresh, brand new sail out of the bag, you run it up your mast, and it snaps into place, and it has a pretty defined shape. And over time, if it loses its crinkle and it gets soft, that shape's not going to be held quite so true. So this is happening really for two reasons, and they're, they're two separate reasons. But it happens because of UV damage, and it also happens because of mechanical wear. So let's talk first about UV damage. So where does the UV light come from? Well, it comes from the sun. And our sail's exposed to it just like our skin's exposed to it when we're out in the sun. And the sail can get sunburned too. So. UV radiation actually breaks down some plastics. And it turns out that the plastics that our sails are made of is the kind of plastic that's broken down by UV radiation. You might ask why we don't use different plastics that aren't susceptible to UV radiation. And I guess the only answer to that is when we're building sails, we're trading off the cost of the sail versus the weight of the sail versus the strength of the sail. And so sailmakers have landed on certain materials and those materials happen to work well in terms of making sails, but they're susceptible to UV. So we need to protect them from UV. Otherwise, over time, they're going to break down in the sun. Now, another thing that we can talk about is mechanical wear. And I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can wear your sail mechanically. We already talked about cuts and scrapes, but let's think about another scenario. So let's say that we're, we've rigged our boat and we're just leaving it either at the dock or on a dolly in the boat park, rigged up, and it's a really windy day and we're not sailing with it. So our sail's luffing, it's actually flogging, it's whipping around, and what we can think about is that the motion of that sail, luffing like that, is actually going to pulverize the material. It's going to be grinding the resin against itself. 
And so all of that resin that the cloth manufacturer treated the cloth with to hold all the fibers in place is going to turn into basically dust. And it's going to crumble out of the sail, and the sail is going to get soft like that. And what you think about when the sail gets soft is that because those fibers aren't going to be held so tightly in place, they can kind of move around. And if they can move around, then that means that the sail can deform. So that just kind of explains why a sail is going to get soft if we let it flog for too long. And this damage is totally irreparable. So over time, your sails are going to get soft. There's nothing you can really do to prevent it, but you can slow it down. Once it happens, the sail's toast. So I'm going to tell you that like a good quality sail might perform optimally for around 100 hours of use. And after that, you can still use it. It'll still push the boat forward, but you're not going to be winning races with it. Some racers even buy new sails every regatta. So I think it bears mentioning that at first they're going to be performing suboptimally. So you're going to be having a harder time sailing upwind with older sails. And that has to do with how they deform over time in terms of their shape. But then eventually when your sails get so old and so sun-baked and so stretched, the actual material that they're made out of starts to come apart and the sails get weak. And then they actually can't withstand the forces of being used. So eventually if you have really old sails, they end up ripping just from their own use. Ideally, you're not going to hang on to your sails long enough that they get to that point. So I want to give you a list of some do's and some don'ts for sail care. So sail care do's. Do roll your sails instead of folding your sails. That's going to be good for the sails because it's going to prevent creasing. And every time you crease the sail, you're going to be breaking down that resin that holds the fibers together. Do keep track of the shape and state of your sails. And you might also want to keep track of the approximate number of hours that you have on your sails. You might want to take a picture of your sail when you first get it, and then later take a picture of it after half a season of use. And finally, at the end of the season, take another picture. See how the shape's changed over time. Do have small rips patched before they spread. So if you have some small damage to your sail, it's not going to cost you that much to have a sailmaker patch it. And if you don't have it repaired, it could turn into a big problem before you know it. Do de-rig your sails when not using them and store them out of the sun. Now that should really go without saying, but as it turns out, it doesn't go without saying. Plenty of people leave their stuff rigged up when they're not using it, and it's a death sentence for your sails. Do de-rig your sails when not using them. And now here are the don'ts. Okay, so don't spread sails out on gravel to roll them. If you spread them out on gravel, then you're just asking to wear little bits of dirt into the sail, and it's gonna break down the resin that holds the fibers together. Don't let the sails air dry by blowing them in the wind. So this is something that you see maybe with spinnakers often, and it's just bad for the sail because it, it's going to get the sail flogging and, again, break down the resin that holds the fibers together. Don't leave jibs furled over long periods of disuse. You come in from sailing, you're going to go away from your boat for a week or so. You have a temptation to furl the jib, so the best thing that you could do for your sail would be to pull it all the way down, roll it up, and store it either inside the boat or inside a shed. Keep it out of the sun. Don't wash your sails. So, you know, over time your sail might get some dirt on it, it might get rusty, you might capsize and the mast gets stuck in the mud and the sail comes up brown. You might have a temptation to take that sail bring it home and put it in the washing machine. This is actually a really, really bad thing that you could do for your sale. So a lot of my do's and don'ts have been based on not breaking down the resin that holds the fibers together in your sale. And this is another one that's like that. And lastly, don't expect your sales to last forever. Even if you take care of them, you still have to replace them eventually. So if you're going to buy a boat, you should budget for replacing one of the major sails on the boat every year. And if you don't want to do that, do it every other year. But don't go too long without replacing your sails, or you'll just end up with a boat that doesn't sail very well, and it'll be frustrating for you. 
So this is going to conclude my sailing theory tutorial on sail construction and sail care. In this video, we talked about how a sailmaker builds shape into a sail, and we talked a little bit about some sail materials and sail care. Keep an eye out for some future videos in which we're going to discuss how sailors can control their shape and why they might want to do that. And we'll talk about the effects of various sail controls. Now, I imagine that'll be a series of videos because the sail controls are pretty complicated and it'll take me a while to get through them. Thank you for watching.